Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. With 946 episodes made, Suspense originally aired on the CBS Radio Network from 1940 to 1962. As usual, we remind you to like and follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and keep the golden age of radio alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com to our Patreon page. Give that donate button a click. And now, Suspense. Tonight, we invite you to enjoy The Devil in the Summer House by John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Carrytown, there is a modest house in its own ground. Behind it, in a spacious garden, and the summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and the weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latest summer house has grown heavy with fire. And only the other evening, two men came into that garden of twilight. Over the shaggy grass, as a storm is brewing along the Hudson. Two men, a lawyer from New York. Who's there? And Captain Bess of the Homicide Squad. Yes, my friend, easy. I was just going to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not Captain Burke. Yeah, the very same in the world. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at the time of night. I was in Perry Town anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. No, I don't see any light. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. And you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground. So they can't be hurt me on you. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library. And the dining room. Come from the lighting. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world. He had his son himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this life. But if we can get inside the house, I don't think we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the key. Why should a dead person send me a letter? Flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were old candles in the mantel. Ah, uh, yes, there they are. Have you matched, Captain? Oh, yes, yeah, all right, then. Oh, that's better. Same old 
we have the furniture. Family, thick carpet, family bread net. Uh, Mr. Parker, this letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Jesus. Hey, yeah, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? That it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't see the envelope. Neither. Dear Joe. Yes, you didn't know it. I am Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenny Mayer died, but we know how he died. It's yes. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenny really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. First part of the back of the drawer was your theory. Yes, that's fine. Yes, sir. Are you sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost the end of the night. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was very Kenny's wife. Beautiful woman. There's the bar that the maid let me in by that afternoon. Well, Captain, thank the maid. They're all here tonight. Who? My son, my son, my son, and the world around us up there as they echo our peers of laughter. It seems that the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? That was a nice school reader. Now, how does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady and drink to our comrades' eyes. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of mail. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenny is always a happy man. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah. He had a good position in his life at the in the front of that company. Yeah, sure, I know. But he just came in major in the army. Now there was a war on the Imperial, do you remember? I remember. To make the world safe, a democracy. Well, old days. Old hearty. Old memory. I remember that blazing hot day in August. When all the windows were up. I remember this run. And Isabel, that was Joe's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember... Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Kenny. He says his name's Parker. Oh, yes, I'm expecting him. Sure, Miss Kenny. All right, ma'am. Shall I take your knitting and your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenny. I just wondered. You can come in now. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Doesn't think it's going to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations. Like Miss Perker. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you came for me? I missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Jim. I had no idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having you on the top. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about you? I'm the shiny new child. That's why I wanted you here. Well, everybody, I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Listen. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here. I've been alone. That sounded like a shock. <laughs> yes, it was a shock. Oh, yes. Doesn't seem to worry. It's only Paul. Jerry's not a Paul. Oh. 
The two gentlemen with their hands to serve. Oh, Jerry asked him out. He got his two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, I don't mind. Jerry fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. You don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down? No, 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 no. As long as you keep away. Poor Joe. What's that? Uh, about Jerry. Who is it this time? Joe. Jerry's been having five days on leave from camp. I don't even mind what camp. But he spent four evenings with those five with, with that fifth woman. Diane, sir? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? No. She's had some attraction again. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just no, that Jerry did it his way, and I don't mind. I may not be without admirers myself. It's come to that. No, no I don't have two that is to the day. I was thinking about Jerry. May not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go by. Paul oh, must be getting really curious down in that cellar. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is to get too much of a gentleman. And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, look out the window. He's finally bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Well, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real yeah, soldiers don't exactly wave their cap, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry! Jerry! Jerry, Joe Parker's here! Joe Parker, he wants to see you! Into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Now, look, Isabel, you've got to slow down. Let me cry again in a minute. How are you going to down? Light up now. Well, then, we'll just pull these lines. Mm-hmm. This will be a good one. Yeah, how's that? It's better, thank you. Can I get you Oh, no. You heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, your highball? No bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The ice man didn't deliver the day of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, no? I doubt it. Listen, Mr. Barrow. Yeah, here you are. Not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thank you. What I wanted to say was, couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up taxi now? Hasn't he done a good deed for the day? Yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. <laughs> you don't have to call me, Miss Canyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty, what is it? It's only to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her Lady Kitty. No. Maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. Diane Fisk? Oh, uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. <laughs> She's a fine lady. I don't want her to my dear. I don't want her to <laughs> Anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. How do you do, Diane? Mm. This is a friend of ours, Mr. Mm. Parker. Now, I don't want to intrude, really. I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon. He simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't. And do you know what he's brought me in his office as a surprise? Yes. A photograph recording machine. He said, let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk time. Oh, no. <laughs> name, can't somebody stop that phone? <laughs> Kitty. Yes, ma'am. Would you please go down the cellar and tell Mr. Kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy? Tell him to stop. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh dear, this is so an idea if I haven't offended you in any way. I, I mean, I'm afraid of a chat about the same people who have red hair often are. <laughs> because at your age, you... You must find the heat very tired. Uh, don't you think you'd all better sit down? I... I was very much interested in what Miss Cook said about our phonograph recording machine. Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about them to make ice. Yes, yes. It was science and wonderful, but I do think it was nearly made you turn into a me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer home. Oh. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? 
Well, I came up to that way and I saw him in a summer house with his head forward on the table. Taking a knife with a chin. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, actually. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength now. So if you'll just excuse me. Well, of course it will. Dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying, because I, I had the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker, but... Parker. Oh, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so defending her this morning. <laughs> Except the man is right. You couldn't have been you, Mr. Barker, a Parker. <laughs> now, could I? Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. I think he likes it to me. Why, if he walked in that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get anything? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I can... Oh. That's Paul. Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. That's pretty untidy in the cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Well, one of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. That sounds like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? Five years ago, Captain Burke, we found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. He was lying on the floor beside him. Shut up, that way. Ah, sir. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that to them. Yes, yeah, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. No, no, no. We never noticed the real shot because... because that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, things, they're all gone. Think about Kenny died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose you guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Yes. Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, you understand? Women know pretty generally. So, they're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone. The old tunes, old girls. Wondering why fellow ever killed him. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon will die, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the door. Now, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that too. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you, just before you pull the trigger. The devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon. Oh, no, he wasn't. What do you mean? Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. I swear, Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Yeah. Diane Cook. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there. He was. He saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house, but didn't stop there. No, that's right. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house. 
You told just a minute or so before Isabel went to escape. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? He was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that might be a captain disposes of everything. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see, I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got the time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? Oh, it's waited 25 years, my friend. It can wait a minute more. You got the key from the Jerry's head in case where it ought to go. 
I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? So, Joe, listen, I, I'm very sick. Please tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark and I don't know what's there. Don't go away. Joe. Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer. And how... Yeah. Cut off and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I will go too. But you turn the rest of now, my friend. You turn the rest of now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Do you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man. Don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Oh, uh, but... Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal fight against me? What did I have to do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. That's the time. That's the good deal if you'll follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband didn't she? Yeah. But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in the record. What? I'm telling you, the real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blamed for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Uh, but she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kidding, the men. Ah, you're talking sense. She shut Jerry from the dining room window. And she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag. She went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped in napkin on a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed it. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she took that letter till the day before yesterday... Then one of the boys at Sing Sing, mm -hmm. thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and nailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They were electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Italian's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was that, that she had done the job alone. Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Well, that's why I had to hear it, too. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes for blazing forever. Eight o'clock. Now she's dead. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime, a story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime, the hushed voice in a howling cat, another adventure in suspense. The inspired the producer, John Beach, the director, and John Dixon, the author, are collaborators on the tent. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
That concludes today's episode. We thank you, and we'd like to remind you to please donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.